Mayor, I think the first thing that we might want to talk about is what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> and by that I mean, how do you define AI? What is it that we're really talking about? The WGA obviously made a recent attempt to do that as part of resolving the strike. Um, so what, do you, what are we talking about? What do you think about their attempt to define it? And since Ted decided to sit furthest from me, I'll put him on the spot first. Well, nice to meet you all. Uh, just making sure this mic works. Uh, so I think when I think about AI, right, I've been uh, kind of working in the field for a while. The, to me, and I think to a lot of people who work closely in the space, AI is a much broader sense than uh, what people talk about today, right? I think this AI wave that's sort of taken the entire world by, swar uh, by swarm this year is like really focused on these large language models, generative image generation models. But I think for a lot of people working in this space, it really captures everything that is even focused on decision making, whether that's just more traditional machine learning, even like, uh, like rule-based algorithms. And so for me, AI is this much larger problem uh, or area to be focused on. Um, and I think it's just interesting to see kind of like how it is going into the mainstream and trying to figure out, um, you know, which parts of it are more specific or interesting for different sectors in the market. We're going one by one, right? Yeah. <laughs> for this one, anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think AI is a concept actually is not new. So it's been around uh, since 1956. Um, so what is interesting in the last 10 years is because we see a lot of acceleration of AI applications due to three reasons. Number one, um, compute power increase. So we have GPU versus CPU, parallel computing. The second thing is the amount of data that we have. So every, each of us, we have a mobile device, constantly capture the text information, the voice information, the video images. So those are a tremendous amount of data that make available for model training. And the third thing is um, algorithm innovations. And um, I think Chris has contribution to that as well. Um, so what, what you're seeing now, nowadays, I think in the race, particular reason, the last few months, what we've been talking about a lot of AI, we're referring to generative AI, particularly after ChatGPT launch. So there's also another concept called AGI. And many people got confused. So AGI is artificial general intelligence. So when we talk about generative AI, so for example, ChatGPT and large language models are generative AI. So they're using uh, existing data to generate new information, new um, answers for, that can be text-based, can be image-based. But AGI, what we're referring to is artificial intelligence that can mimic human and can really operate like a human brain. So generative AI is today, and we may see AGI in our lifetime. Jessica. OK, how about that? So AI has been in, around in the games industry since, since I started in industry in uh, 1998. And we had AI with the characters that would run around and you would in interact with them. It's also used in anti-cheat software, also with matchmaking. And so it's a concept that's been around inside of the games industry for a long time. And obviously now that people are interacting with AI and they know they're interacting, it's gotten a lot, a lot more press. But to answer the question about the definition from the, from the strike, um, I did go and I, I read that because I knew I had the questions before, luckily. And I think that they did a pretty good job defining AI for what they're worried about. If the AI that they're worried about is going to actually be what they should be worried about, that's, that's another question. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things happening in the industry right now in general outside of just AI. But I think that their definition was saying it's taking input in, calculating it, and then pushing out new content is fairly accurate for what they were worried about. Well, I'm sure the WJ would be glad to hear that um, in, in terms of that. Chris, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I think the only thing I would add, Steve, and, and you know, great to be here with this esteemed panel. The, the only thing I would add is sort of the following. Like AI to me is the process of building an artificial model to make decisions. 
And so all sorts of decisions are applicable in the media industry, in government, in science. Those are things like looking at some data and classifying it, deciding what type of category it belongs to, looking at some numbers and trying to figure out what the next numbers are and things, taking a bunch of data and sorting, sorting it, you know, whether it's uh, no one has DVDs or Blu-rays anymore, but we used to do that with things. Maybe we sort other things. Maybe we sort our favorite Batman or Lego stuff since we're at the Lego place, you know, whatever, right? So that's clustering, that's prediction, that's classification. And building models to do that repetitively, that doesn't get tired, that's based on data, all of those things, that's, that's AI. Um, the big things that changed uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, Lake kind of coined some of them, computing changed. You don't need all of the money in the world or to be a big technical technology company or big rich company to be able to do AI. We can do it on a GPU that we can rent for very cheap or things like that. So commodity computing changed the game for that. The other thing that changed is data as the new oil. Uh, there's an infinite supply of data that's out there on social media and other places. Now we have pipelines, just like Chevron and BP and things like that, that can take that raw crude data and make it into oil for hungry AI, which is dependent on that. And the last thing that changed is we now have AI models <laughs> that replicate our senses. Uh, that are as good or better for computer vision since 2012, that are as good or better for the auditory system, for our ears that hear sound and turn them into text, 2014, 2018, BERT, natural language conversation. Those are the things that changed, and that's why everyone's so jazzed up about AI today. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, obviously, as a lawyer, I can't resist but mention some of the things that come to my mind which is some of the litigation that has arisen over AI, particularly as long as we're here in Hollywood and we're talking about the creative industries and ownership of what somebody creates. There are obviously several pending cases regarding the training uh, and the argument that, that the training itself, the scraping that you were talking about, constitutes infringement. Um, US copyright law at the moment does not recognize copyright in machine-generated works, although there, there is the potential recognition if there is meaningful human contribution, whatever that means. Um, I'm in, based in the UK, where in the UK, uh, copyright does exist in a machine-generated work, and the EU is somewhere in between. So with all of these issues floating around about copyright, and this is for anyone who wants to take it on, where do you see this going? What is the further evolution of these issues and potential harmonization of copyright law. I think Ted is right. Okay, yeah. Um, so actually, I had the pleasure to actually speak with some lawyers uh, when Deepfake first came out. And I think that was probably one of the first times that uh, you know there was a very large concern about like kind of copyrightable content, uh, the ability to take anyone's face where there's like, pictures of them on the internet, overlay them onto any video, and create whatever content you like. Um, and I think that, you know, going through that and thinking of what is the process of going through it, I feel like there's like three major components that go into creating this sort of generative content, right? So the first one is uh, what you sort of mentioned at the beginning. It is the underlying data set. Uh, whether you're using open source or you're collecting your own data set, uh, Chris is talking about it, you know, data is the oil that kind of feeds into everything. Uh, the second component is who actually utilizes it to train the model, right? Uh, there is a clearly a very important component of creativity and technical skills that are needed to leverage the data into the correct way. Otherwise, you know, everyone could have made ChatGPT. Uh, then actually the third one is the person who used the downstream product. Uh, so, you know, while ChatGPT is awesome, it's not like if you look at someone who's very skilled at leveraging ChatGPT or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, uh, the quality of output that they can produce is highly different than the others. So I think there's like, you know, there's three major components in my mind. Um, and to me, it seems like the most straightforward, concrete, easy to pin down component of it is actually that underlying data set. And so to me, it feels like it's almost like a logical first step. Um, but over time, I'm actually very curious to see how it will sort of lay out over time. And, you know, when something that is produced at the very end, how does that success get attributed? How does that, you know, ownership, how does the profits, uh, go to any single one of these. Because in the end of the day, I think a lot of these tools that are being produced, uh, you know, five, 10 years from now, we're gonna see them as daily tools that we're using, much like an artist uses Photoshop today, right? Um, and figuring out what is that like licensing model, how does the, 
product get created and how does like any of this work out? And it's, I think it's a really challenging ongoing problem right now. Yeah, in some ways I think obviously we're talking about provenance. We're talking, I mean, there is an argument that just the training itself, if you're making digital copies of works that enjoy copyright, that that is, constitutes copyright infringement. That's the basis of the Getty Images case. That's the basis of Sarah Silverman's lawsuit, et cetera. Um, so are we moving towards something that goes back to watermarking um, or other means of trying to identify the data set? So, so Steve, I, I think that that's what's so hard about this. So first, like, you know, since you mentioned watermarking, watermarking I'll just kind of throw that out there. The best that I've seen in terms of state of the art in the industry for doing that is like things generated with AI will watermark those. You know, like they're putting it out, like Google put a tool out and said, hey, you know, if, we, if you use our tools to build AI images, we'll watermark them. But that doesn't account for the vast majority of content which doesn't use their tools, but uses like, you know, homegrown or other generative AI. And so you need very expensive, like, you know, very costly tools to do that. So that's not gonna necessarily do it. The strategy that I see, and actually I just read an article in Time about this, is that the, um, the companies like OpenAI are now offering to pay for lawsuits, you know, basically. They're offering to pay, like if you, they're trying to flood the zone. They're trying to say, use our tools, use our tools, you know, while this stuff is being litigated, use our tools and flood the zone. Um, and that's because it's gray, <laughs> you know, kind of the zone is very gray right now with respect to, to AI and doing that. It's almost like when X and, and Elon Musk, you know, offered to pay people that were in litigation related to their, you know, being canceled on X and, and things like that, you know, before. So it's a very kind of murky area. Um, the best that they can do, because, you know, who, sorry, I stand up here with the rest of these experts telling you, we don't know in layer 100 of the neural network what it actually learned. When it's a trillion neuron network, anyone that tells you here on this stage, they know they're wrong. <laughs> we don't. We don't know, but so that's why they stay around the periphery and they talk about the source data and then they talk about the impacts from the predictions. That's the best we could do right now in terms of IP and provenance. Yeah, the, the, I think both are really well said and, and uh, the thing I want to add to is that when we're looking to the underlying data that use for machine learning, um, the way we look at it is one is what data go into the model. Are they actually uh, infringe any copyright? Um, and on the way out, the data out, we also look into um, how do we really determine the derivative of a new creation, how much it is. And I think at a certain point, we'll find out, you know, as Chris mentioned, that you, even you want to watermark all the data, eventually you'll find out a huge amount of data or high percentage of data all watermark. And what's the difference of the one with or without, if they all. So what is interesting is to look into like how much how, much, how, how do you really determine like, how much is generated by AI, how much is generated into human? How do you weight that? So I think it's a very interesting question. I don't think we have an uh, answer yet. So in the video game industry, people are obviously using um, AI right now, generative AI. And most of the studios to get around this issue are only using internally sourced material. So they'll only use art that's made by their artists and if you think about, you know, how many of us have used Grammarly or a spell checker, right? If you have that material that you created and then you run it through some AI, sure, spell checker isn't very good, Grammarly's a little bit better, and maybe a large language model is, you know, is even better. And so if you're only using your data, then that, that is what um, they have been doing right now. And I think that personally that that will, that will stand up because you just really can't say that you can't can you not use Photoshop on your own images? You can, and so therefore, it'll just it'll just work its way out. Yeah, I was just going to add. Yeah, I think the gaming industry is one of those industries that's a little lucky in this aspect because uh, not only do they typically have their own very rich source <laughs> of data, but even when it comes to the games themselves, they have their own you know entire game engine, and they can simulate and build anything they'd like to off of there. And uh, honestly, I think that's why a lot of AI advancements have been done in the gaming industry. Um, but I think it's very much an exception. And what we're seeing now is that type of work being, you know, bleeding into other uh, sectors where it's now becoming kind of an issue to figure out. So as long as we are in Hollywood and seeing, the, seeing as leaving aside the copyright issues for a moment, do you envision a world in which 
we have machine-generated films in which what the studios now do and all of the workforce that is used to create these films, that one day we have potentially a scenario where films, short or long, can be machine-generated without the same workforce and pretty much on command. I'm not sure if I would say on command, or at least not quite now, but uh, I think we're definitely moving in that direction. Uh, I'm not sure if people have seen, but someone actually just using uh, generative AI was able to create an entire South Park episode, all the scripting, all the animations, uh, all the voices, and I mean, I haven't watched too much South Park, but I've watched enough to know that when I watched this one episode, it was like shockingly good. Um, it did involve, uh, you know, this is where I mean the not on demand part, it probably or almost definitely involved a lot of iteration, you know, iterating on the script over and over, passing it, telling the AI, you know, this part, can you rewrite this line, can you change this, and you know, cherry picking the best scenes. Um, but the technology is already there, right? I think what's challenging to figure out is first of all, how do we make it a higher fidelity than the cartoon, but also how does that process change over time? But um, yeah, the workforce is almost certainly going to change. Uh, I mean, if we kind of extrapolate to like art, again, I mentioned Photoshop earlier, you know, when people were first making films, Photoshop didn't exist. And if those people saw into the future and saw people making art with Photoshop, all the layers, all the tooling, they'd think this is crazy. And none of their skills really overlap, except maybe their creativity. Um, that is, I think, what's going to happen with AI-assisted tooling as well. Um, I think one thing that's a little undervalued uh, by people is that there, at least in my opinion, there's still quite this uh, level of skill and creativity that's involved in leveraging AI the correct way, um, in identifying you know, uh, the best uses or the best ways to use the technology. Um, just because it's become more accessible doesn't mean that the expression is not there. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'm here in my personal capacity, so I don't care what I say. So, you know, I'll just, <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, it's, it's, totally, it's totally possible for that to happen. But, like, you know, I think the question we should ask is, how many Oppenheimers is it going to generate? I, I'm not sure how many that it's going to generate anytime soon. How many bad Saturday morning cartoons is it going to generate? Probably a lot. And probably should we have been watching all that? Or if that entertains us, you know, that's okay, fine, you know, and, and things like that. So... You know, um, the, uh, the making films is a creative, it's a creative business. It's a business. There's a business in, you know, related to that. And so um, that has to do with economics. And one of my favorite principles in em economics is asymmetric information. And, you know, the principle related to that, just for everybody, is that when I sell you a house, I really make the kitchen and the bathroom look really nice but you don't know that there's rats inside the walls, right? You know, that's the trick. It's asymmetric information, right? And so it's the same thing in this concept with respect to AI and film generation and things like that. What we give it, you know, that South Park episode required tons of iteration because there was so much asymmetric information principle that you couldn't capture everything that went to the business of, you know, Trey and Matt and everything they did with South Park. You know, because, so it was probably a South Park episode, but that required, like you said, you know, so, it had so much of that orchestration and everything else. As soon as we invert that problem and you see the rats inside the walls with x-ray vision, that's when you should be worried because then they probably will get closer to Oppenheimer. Yeah. Well, isn't what you're saying then that the machines will simply get smarter, their training will get better, yep. and so that they will know how to take into account the rats in the walls, and they will also, having done one South Park episode, be able to iterate many more. Yes. Well, I think I think a lot of uh, we're doing right now. If you're looking to, if we measure the current stage of general AI, a lot of information, new information we see is generated from previous pattern, right? So anything is following a specific pattern, it really will do really really well to regenerate something interesting. So that's, that's why it's harder to get this nova idea, a really interesting idea, come of it. When you try to write with ChatGPT, it looks like fantastic word salad, right? So it's really good, uh, well-worded, but lacking of innovative idea. That's the current stage. I don't know what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years. Just switching topics for a moment, um, this was obviously a very busy week in terms of government role in AI. We had Biden's executive order. We had the Bletchley Park Summit in London uh, and the Bletchley Declaration. 
So governments uh, seemingly flexing their muscles in terms of AI. Um, what do you think that these meetings and these declarations, these orders, what do they actually portend in terms of government's role? Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. So I think that AI, for most people, it's very, it's very scary because the thought of AI coming and taking your job, you know, at first when machines came, it's like, oh, well, they're taking manual labor. Nobody wants to do manual labor. That's okay. But now that they're coming for creative roles that most people want, it's very scary. And so I think the, the biggest advantage of having the highest office, you know, in, here in the United States actually thinking about AI is the protections that they're going to put in place for workers who are displaced by AI and for people who are afraid of AI. And so whatever there is in there, it's, I mean, they, they're not going to make something that's really, really awesome. We know that the government won't do that. But what they can do is put in protections for the workers. And so I think that's the biggest impact. Totally, uh, totally agree with you, Jessica. And, and so just, just so everyone knows what's in there, kind of summarized, because I was on Fox 11 last night talking about this. So um, what's in that order is basically they're mandating 90 days for every government agency to basically study and define the job description, because their assumption is that every organization in the government needs a chief AI officer, number one. The duties of that are expected to be maintain a continuous inventory of AI technology and report it to Office of Management and Budget. There are protections in there for skilled AI labor and workforce and basically immigration related to visas and H-1Bs and things related to that and recommendations related to that. And then additionally, the other things that they are kind of looking at is they're asking, they're creating a part of the Department of Commerce to basically be AI regulation underneath commerce, but they're asking companies and agencies to self-report. And that's the rub, is that self-reporting, you know, is, you're self-reporting, <laughs> you know? And so that's, so the teeth in that, that's missing, you know? But it's something, it's a start, upskilling, all of these things that you're talking about, they have to be part, and they talked about that in the UK, that's part of that framework, you know? But, but, but yes, like you have to use the bully pulpit from the highest office in the land to try and move the needle a little a little. That, yeah. Is it is it a little bit too little too late? Is it are they sort of where they should be? What do you think in terms of where are they on the curve? Well, I think the government typically is, is going to be a little behind, right? So uh, this is not only applied to AI. If you look at blockchain and other new technology innovations, uh, the regulations and the compliance will always come a little bit behind. The reason is that they need to understand the space. So I, I think, you know, in my interactions with different uh, government agencies in the last few months, and I was actually very pleasantly surprised that there's a lot of curiosity from both the state and federal government and to understand what AI is and also surround them with uh, the experts. Um, so I think that's a really good sign. And uh, I know, uh, you know, it looks like it's still on a high, very high level, right? We all have the questions, how do you execute it? But that's a very good start. Um, so, and in addition to the requirement, the red, red team safety, you know, self-discipline discipline requirement, I do see that in the industry, there are also different organizations start forming self-discipline. So it's not just, you know, meta or, Open AI say we are the safety team that trust us, but also we're trying to form industry lines as well. Well, I think that touches on the issue though that that for now a lot of the platforms are in the control of bigger tech companies, um, and so self policing of bigger tech companies uh, seems a little bit, as you said, Chris. Kind of, is that really going to take place? Is that really going to be implemented? So where is the competition potentially going to come from? Um, is it going to come from the startup sector? Where is actual competition with these big tech companies going to emerge, if it can emerge? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's hard to self-discipline anyways, right? Like, <laughs> because even though you have, have the you best... you told your kids to try yeah, to... Yeah, exactly, right? right? Try to behave. Um, but the, the thing is that even though you have the best intention, you're going to have blind spots. Um, so I think that the framework, the process to be open-minded to take the input 
is really important, either from the peers or from, your cons from consumers or from the regulators is really, really important. Um, the competition from the startup, definitely yes, right? So there are different levels that, uh, you know, in, uh, startup can compete because often we're saying, well, the tech giants are so, so big, they have so much capital, so the startup cannot compete, which is actually not true because those tech giants were startups too, right, 10 years ago. Um, the, there are infrastructure layer, um, there's foundational models, and typically those laser layers take uh, more time, more resources, more funding to establish. But at, um, at application layers, there's so much more innovations happening right now. Right? Even at IHA Foundation, if you look at open source, there's just so much more than uh, it was like five years ago. So I think that's another area that, that uh, we'll see a lot of innovations. Yeah, to add on to that, I think, uh, especially that application layer, there's like a certain um, for big companies, right? Uh, they obviously have the uh, capita and like capital and the manpower to train these foundational models, but especially when you've established a certain reputation as a certain type of company or a certain quality of company, uh, the, the level and polish of products that you're able to really like launch or like actually test out in the real world, um, they have to meet a certain bar. Um, and this is, I think, inherently going to slow down the ability for them to sort of iterate and like try out new ideas. And I think that this is really where startups can shine because they don't have to kind of carry around that certain level and they can really just try any idea that really like speaks out to them, take kind of the shotgun approach and eventually some of them are gonna land. And I think that's where a lot of the really cool innovation is gonna come from or at least start from and then potentially they'll be acquired by a larger company, who knows. Yeah, the, the parts that kind of like I'm thinking about related to this is that, you know, is parity in, in the organizational structure. So to kind of come back to your, you know, question, Steve, or whatever related to like, you know, what's going to happen, you know, how do you police or regulate this stuff? The problem is like, when, as soon as there's a video that comes out that like lies about, you know, Israel or Hamas or that lies about Ukraine or Russia, who at a company, you know, who's the throat to choke related to this right now? There is no chief AI officer or things like that, right? And so you can think about like back to the Equifax hack or back to Solar Winds. That really developed the rise and prominence of the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, right? Which basically said, hey, you know, when stuff hits the fan, uh, you know, related to that, related to cybersecurity, here in a company, like, that's... And so some of these, like, regulations that are coming from the government that say, hey, look, you need organizational parity or structure so that we just have a known understanding when inevitably we generate f deep fakes and someone, you know, it's on a 24-7 news cycle, CNN reports it or some other trusted news, you know, we have a problem then. Who's the throat to choke? And so you need, you need basically that to happen. You need organizational parity, whether you're moving fast in a tech company, in the government, in the media, whatever. You need parity related to that. You need to understand their function, you know, because, and that's where the regulatory agencies kind of come in and start to kind of think about that. I think Hollywood will follow. You know, I think you'll see chief AI officers eventually at studios and things like that. And they have to. You need organizational parity. You can't understand this. Yeah, actually, I already see a number of uh, CEO at this point, <laughs> chief AI officers. And, and the other thing I actually just want to mention, uh, uh, UAE just had their first uh, minister of AI. So they're one of the first countries that established the whole department just dedicated for AI innovation, governance, and compliance. So as long as we also have a couple of gaming experts as well, so it's the combination of gaming and AI, um, just Jessica and, and Ted, what do you think are some of the examples of the most innovative uses of AI within the gaming industry? There's a lot of ideas that people have in the AI industry, right? I think um, maybe I won't answer exactly what is the most innovative, but I think I'll, I'll talk about what it looks like to be the most impactful first. Um, but uh, I think a lot of times when people are thinking about how can we leverage AI uh, in video games, one of the first things they think about is NPCs, right? Um, everyone is now talking with ChatGPT the same way that they kind of wish they could talk to NPCs in video games. Uh, you know, they think, oh, just plug and play and this will be cool. Uh, you know, for me personally, I actually think that this is probably not one of the most impactful things. I think it is probably over time going to be uh, something that will transform the types of games that we can have, but uh, at least in the immediate future, you know, next one to five years from now, uh, to me it feels like the most uh, powerful applications of AI is actually just going to be developer productivity. It's going to change the way that uh, 
game developers can prototype, iterate, and actually scale up the games that they want to make in ways that were never done before, right? Um, so to take like an example, um, if you want to make like an MMORPG, uh, part of the fun of that game is how expansive the world is, how awesome the storytelling is, um, how in, like, in depth you can get with it and the narrative and all of the different parts. The unfortunate reality to that and probably why we don't see so many companies making MMORPGs is because you need a massive team to support that kind of work. And that's a massive cost, it's a massive risk. Um, with AI, you know, this is something that can be massively scaled out. Uh, and so the viability of games like this that depend on scale hugely increased. Uh, even on games that are simpler, right? Uh, there's a ton of work that needs to go into prototyping. Uh, something that is very common, especially in like strategy games, is that they will do what's called paper prototyping. Why? Because it's the easiest thing they can do. Uh, they literally draw out pieces of paper, you know, they label this as the knight, and then they move it around. Uh, that is how they try to find fun in some of their games. Uh, but a lot of the times, you know, you need something that's a little higher fidelity. Uh, you need like, Maybe it's not fun unless the art is cool or unless the characters interact in a certain way. And AI is going to really bridge that gap so that kind of the quick and dirty prototyping is a lot easier. And so I just feel like games are going to be made at like a much faster, quicker, crazier rate. And really, the scale of games is really going to take off. So I think one of the biggest places, and I'm glad that you didn't say this, because I was like, what happens if he says the same thing I'm going to say? That's what you get if you tell me to go first. I know, that's, <laughs> no. No, I don't know what I would have said if you would have said this. Um, so I think one of the things that is a real challenge inside the games industry right now, which a lot of people don't see, is a lot of games are ruined because of bad actors inside of the game. Not actors as in like the people who are you know, doing the storytelling, but other players. And so you come in and you play and you ask somebody, oh, have you played you know, the latest the latest first person shooter, and they're like, no, how many times do I need to be sworn at by a 13-year-old to know that I'm really bad at video games now? And so when I've, um, I remember talking with one of my colleagues who is, works at a casual games company, so not even one of these big, massive, um, large, large games like the, um, the RPGs, and he was saying that their main use of AI is in interfacing with the consumer and helping them with the game, and then also making sure that the players are interacting well with each other. So going in and using AI to be able to get rid of cheating is huge because nobody wants to go in and play with people who are cheating. And I know that for, for most players, myself included, and you know, also for my children, they like to play with other real human beings. They don't necessarily want to play with AI. So even if there was a really awesome AI, is it really fun to play chess against AI? Like there's a lot of AI chess out there and they're really good, but you don't necessarily want to play against them. You want to play against even some random person in the Midwest is better to play against than playing against the AI. But that's because you can beat them. You yeah. can't beat that's them. That's true. <laughs> I know. And it's it's a little bit it's a little bit worrisome because my to be honest, my son plays chess online and he plays with random people and it's a little concerning but I know that it's a lot more fun for him to play with a random person who you know might have to even leave earlier or you know he can't he can't leave the game so my youngest also playing rec room um, he's like oh I I can't stop mom because you know there's this kid that I'm playing with and so the thought that AI would take that away no I think it's just going to help match make like make sure that you're actually matching kids together and that they're not being abusive and that they're not swearing because, you know, you don't want your kids well, I think, swearing. I think it's a really interesting point because that's AI as a watchdog. Um, yes. AI actually providing the guardrails. It's just, um, it's just making the game better because in, for video games, AI has been making video games better since video games were invented. There's so many applications of AI instead of the video game. Yeah, I, I'm not at a game studio, but I have to. I have three kids, so I have to double click on what you just said. You know, to Jessica related to that. Very brief, and I know we're running short on time, but you know, I'll almost take a different perspective too. Like, you know, I think some of the problems is that human beings have lost the guardrails behind their keyboard as keyboard warriors, and they've become massively toxic. You know, so like I actually find in my own experience with my 14-year-old that the real human beings that he's playing with are the toxic you know, people. Like, they're the ones that on Fortnite or on Rocket League leave, cuss him out, and then log off or just constantly rag on him, you know, and things like that. Not to say that AI is the answer, 
But I, I find myself like remarking to my 14-year-old, I have three kids, an eight and a six-year-old too, the 14-year-old, I tell him, God, can it just be easy like when the you know Madden 94 AI used to kick my butt all the time, but I knew it was a robot, so who cared? You know, it didn't like cuss me out and then tell it was gonna come to my house afterward, you know, and all of that. That's the that's the part that so I'm not sure like it's human versus AI, but I feel you actually where you're coming from because you know, Elon released Grok. I mean, imagine Grok being you know the player. It's a real problem. It's a right? real problem, it's a real you know? problem yep. that needs fixing, and AI AI can actually do it. And yep. and even if it's something as simple as, you know, some players like to be Henri in the, in the games, and maybe the Henri people can play against each other because maybe they enjoy that, and that's fine if that's what they enjoy. And then nice people like all of us and our children, because none, <laughs> none of us are are naughty. I know that. <laughs> And then so we can all play with each other. And that's why, you know, there you go, go online and you play with your family and you play with your friends. You don't, you know, playing with strangers is a little dangerous. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. So on that note uh, about community and respectful community, I'll turn it over to the audience for some questions, uh, if anybody does have some questions for our panel. It's hard to see with the light shining, but... I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, I see oh. one back there. The mic's making its way. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, panelists, for being here. We're really enjoying the conversation. So uh, several of your discussion points were on the edge of a <clears throat> key topic uh, that I think is going to be uh, discussed much, much more in the public. It certainly is right now in private organizations, and that's AI governance. Um, you know, governance that is going to be very broad-ranged and will be understood by board members all the way down to perhaps new, new hires. Uh, it affects policy, how processes are going to be organized, business processes, I mean reporting, communication processes, and very much uh, needs to rely on clean, good data, maybe uh, requiring data governance as well. But when I think of AI and ethics generally, AI governance is no silver bullet, but it seems to be the best general approach towards solving lots of unethical consequences, where you've got perhaps mischievously intent, you know, with determination, bad outcomes, bad data, so that you can trick or fool somebody. Uh, the, the issue of biases that I think we've all been reading about because our data was never good to begin with because it had some biases built into it, et cetera, et cetera. So for any of you who are comfortable, could you share some thoughts around what's needed in AI governance or, or some similar type of uh, concept so that we can all have more, rel more reliance and very importantly, more trust? Yeah, so, so um, I can give a first try. So um, for data governance, actually, you know, you actually touched on this. So we cannot talk about the AI governance strategy without talking about data governance. Uh, so step number one is that what data, as an organization, what are the high value data property that we have? What are the proprietary data that we have? And what are the public data that we're willing to share, right? So that's step one to understand that what do you have and where you put it, who do you share with? Um, and then the second part is that once you determine what your assets are, and the second is to assign the team to understand who, who is going to be the, uh, the person in your organization as experts or, or who are carrying that role. So that actually starting from the board level, right? So a lot of boards today don't really have AI experts in, in place. So step number one is looking to the board composition. Do you need to add experts to the board? Do you need... Um, have external uh, advisors to the board? Do you need this AI governance to be currently um, led by which committee? Is the audit committee, is risk committee, is technology committee, right? So those are things that I think the within organization have to start from all the way up to down. Um, and then the governance also looking to like, what, what is the outcome you try to drive, right? So it is for, um, are you focused on the AI bias? Are you looking to the IP, uh, IP and copyright infringement? Because sometimes when you have data uh, strategy uh, or AI governance strategy for yourself, and a lot of times people only fo focus on our own organizations. But any company now have multiple vendors. So have you looked into your vendors and suppliers? And what, what is that point? And when you use any API, are you 
oppose the potential, create any potential risk of copyright infringement as well. And like I would just add to that very briefly that you know when you talk about corporate governance related to AI, you got to talk about HR data. You got to talk about having HR involved in comms and change management. Classic examples that come up in the corporate world, at least for me, is um, I'm a group manager and I manage a bunch of people. I put in all of their private employee data into ChatGPT and it told me what I should rank them. That's okay, right? You know, probably not. Um, you know, or whatever. So there's that. Um, you know, outside of doing that, which is don't, you know, and, and, and everything else, um, you know, there's also those other things like, hey, I had my annual cybersecurity training. I put it into ChatGPT, got all the answers, passed it with flying colors, you know. That's okay, right? Probably not. And, you know, that begs of the question of not IP exfiltration, but what types of data, everybody's focused on the Samsung case and, you know, getting data out, you know, in IP, but it's also corporate personal knowledge, you know, all of those things. So. AI governance at an organization needs to be a whole of organization. It needs to be a cross-functional team at the leadership level involving change management, HR, comms, everything else. And you know, comms or HR will say, oh, we don't know H, you know, or legal, oh, we don't know AI. Bring them in the boardroom. Bring them there because they need to be part of it because they need to understand this is happening. You know, it's not just lawyers and doctors that are passing the bar and the medical exam with this. It's people in your company today and it needs governance. Well, to Jessica's point, I saw a presentation uh, about a week ago from a startup, actually, and it's about AI to actually create AI governance within a company. So, no, this is, this is serious. Um, the idea is that it trains on you as an employee or as an executive. So it's training on how you communicate and your communications. It's not taking the data. So it sits as an API. And then the notion is, based on your corporate policies, if you're going to communicate something or do something that in the email or otherwise that is not within the corporate policies, it will alert you to that. So to Jessica's early point, sometimes you can use AI to actually be the AI governance, subject, of course, then to its fallibility. Not all doom and gloom, huh? No, I'm, I'm personally really excited about AI. So I know a lot of people aren't, but I think it's going to be good. Uh, thank you for those awesome ideas and opinions. Uh, sorry to be a little negative, but um, when the internet showed up and everybody was connected, something that soon after followed was, well, worms and spam and whatnot. And it took some time before the Cloudflare and the Kaspersky's and whatnot showed up to help reduce. And well, the Gmail spam filter showed up, of course, early AI, which people don't think of AI, unfortunately. but that is definitely early days. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how we can avoid the dark ages coming up next, when unfortunately people will start using, those, those not so nice people who are nobody in this room, of course, will start to use AI to actually bully children online and things of that nature, and how we can hopefully reduce some of that upfront. Yeah, I think unfortunately, like, the answer is like not gonna be great. Um, it's honestly gonna be like an arms race, right? Uh, whether you can like, because really the best way to govern the AI, as we mentioned earlier, is probably to use more AI. Um, and so it's really gonna be an arms race. Recently there was a, a paper that came out where someone was able to train a LLM to identify if a report was written by ChatGPT, right? Like this is obviously a much uh, lower stakes version of what you're talking about, but students are using ChatGPT to write all of their essays. And there is now an arms race between students and educators on like, I wanna, tr like, get past this LLM detector, right? Um, I mean, we saw a similar thing with, um, many years ago, Stanford built something that like decompiles your code and sees if, you know, if you copied your code based on someone else based on the underlying assembly. We're gonna see a lot of things like that. And honestly, that's one of the areas where it's like, uh, this is gonna sound like a little weird, but like governance is like something we need to be almost careful of because if we hinder AI development too much, then bad actors who are not going to care about any governance are going to go rampant. And so there needs to be this balance where, you know, good actors or, um, you know, companies that are trying to address a lot of these AI issues are able to do their development at a sufficient rate to keep up with what's happening. I, hopefully, though, I think I would hope to say that, like, a lot of technology has seen what you're referring to as, like, dark ages when new technology arises um, enough times to know that they need to take this as seriously as they can this time. But it's just gonna be an arms race. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm more, I'm more optimistic. I'm worried, but I'm optimistic. 
and here's the reason. Um, so, you know, a lot of, I got a lot of questions asked me, is the human versus AI, or is the co-piloting relationship? Um, the way I look at it is co-parenting. Uh, why, why use parenting? Because, um, so AI, even though it looks pretty sophisticated today, it's still really a baby. Uh, it may can mimic or creating some words that sound sophis sophisticated, but we're really at a very early stage of developing AI. Um, so if any of you are a parent, you will know that if you raise a baby, right, so you, what you really want to do is not only just give the nutrition and knowledge, and you really want this person, the kid is to be a really good person. So how do you do this? So not only uh, giving the physical support, you want to give the right guidance, right? You want to, this little kid to hang out with the right group. So that's why we're training the model. We can train a perfect spoken model, but if you're putting the a really um, toxic environment because the model trained itself, then very soon this kid is going to start cursing, right? Um, so, and then you really have a short period of window because um, we may be at taller stage, but you want to make sure this kid is getting the right guidance, hang out with right group, and you do the, this micro adjustment, make sure that it's on the right track before it turns out to a teenager that will not listen to you anymore, right? Um, and then the other thing I, I would mention is that we also, as a human, that we have this responsibility, right? As a parent, we say, do what I say, not what I do, right? Uh, that's what, it, what we're telling AI too, right? So why you are biased? Why are Tom's driving hit, hit a person, right? But we look at ourselves, so we're not so good actors either. Um, so this whole conversation about AI bias is really tricky because how do we define bias? Find me a person that does not have any bias, right? So. So it's very interesting. I think the, when we think about co-parenting or raising AI in the future, is it does take a village to raise a child properly. So I think this is going to be uh, not only just the in, going to the innovator or going to give it a push to the regulator. It does take a lot of collaborations, not only just this government, other governments, and, both public and private sectors, and also, for example, educators, right? So we, we teach our students, we teach them how to use the weapon, create a weapon. They need to understand the importance and significance of it. No, I think that's a great note to end on because I've been given the wrap-up signal, but I think that's a really important note in terms of exactly what you're talking about, Lake, which is the training, which is the governance, which is the guidance, um, and, and ultimately, the, the child that you're raising. Um, and I think the only really big difference that I'm thinking of as I'm listening to you though is at least human children, they go year to year. I think this child is growing much more quickly um, in terms of the pace. And so the parenting that's necessary is, is also has to adapt to that pace. But I think it's a great, great way to end, end the session. And I thank you guys for taking the time and coming out here.